The Roy Rogers Museum was like a little slice of the Wild West right around the corner, a place where fans of all ages could enter the world of the King of the Cowboys. For years, it was a go-to spot filled with nostalgia, showcasing everything from shiny saddles to memorabilia that brought back fond memories of classic Western films. But now, those doors have closed for good, leaving many of us scratching our heads and wondering how we got to this point. What happened to such an iconic landmark? Let's stroll down memory lane and uncover the story behind the closure of the Roy Rogers Museum. Before we go into why the Roy Rogers Museum closed its doors, let's first explore the story behind its creation and why it became such an iconic place in the first place. Roy Rogers. Leonard Franklin Sly, who we all know as Roy Rogers, was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Maddie and Andrew Andy Sly on November 5, 1911. Growing up in a tenement on 2nd Street, which later became the site of Riverfront Stadium, Roy used to joke, I was born at second base, destined for greatness from the start. He wasn't alone, growing up with three sisters, Kathleen, Mary, and Cleta. Andy Sly wasn't a big fan of city life or his job. He hated it so much that he and his brother Will decided to ditch it all and build a 12 by 50 foot houseboat using salvaged wood. Who hasn't dreamt of leaving the nine to five grind to float down a river? In July, 1912, the Sly family set off on this houseboat adventure, making their way up the Ohio River toward Portsmouth, Ohio. They eventually planned to build a house on some land they bought, but life had other plans. After the great flood of 1913, the family moved their houseboat onto dry land and kept living in it. In 1919, the Slys decided to put down more permanent roots and bought a farm in Duck Run, near Lucasville, Ohio, about 12 miles north of Portsmouth. They built a six-room house, but it was only a short time before Andy realized farming wouldn't make them rich. He worked at a shoe factory in Portsmouth to keep things afloat. Andy would come home every weekend, and like the classic dad move, he'd bring gifts. Once, he brought home a horse one of the best gifts young Leonard could have received, because that's how he learned to ride. Little did anyone know, this was just the beginning of his cowboy journey. Without modern entertainment like radio, the Sly family had to make their fun. Saturday nights were all about square dancing. Neighbors would come over and Leonard would sing, play the mandolin, and even call out the dance moves. It was good old-fashioned country entertainment. This was also when Leonard learned how to yodel. He and his mom would yodel across the farm to communicate, which sounds way more fun than shouting, dinner's ready. Leonard started high school in McDermott, Ohio, but after two years, the family packed up and returned to Cincinnati, where Andy found another job at a shoe factory. Realizing that the family needed extra income, Leonard quit school to join his dad at the factory. He did try to keep up with his education by going to night school, but when you're working long hours and falling asleep in class, it's hard to concentrate. After getting teased for nodding off, Leonard gave up on school for good. It wasn't exactly a stay in school success story, but he turned out okay. By 1929, Leonard's older sister Mary and her husband had relocated to Lawndale, California, which seemed like the place to be. Leonard and Andy decided to quit their factory jobs, pack up their old 1923 Dodge, and head west to visit. The California dream didn't quite stick, and after four months, they returned to Ohio. But it was only a short time before the Golden State called again. This time, Leonard had the chance to return with Mary's father-in-law. He didn't hesitate, and the Sly family followed in the spring of 1930. Settling near Mary in Lawndale, Leonard and his dad found work driving gravel trucks for a highway construction project. Life in California seemed promising, but just like that, the company went bankrupt in 1931. No job, no money, classic Great Depression woes. Not one to give up. Leonard headed to Tular, California and found work picking peaches for Del Monte. It wasn't glamorous, but it was work. He lived in a labor camp that could have been pulled straight from the grapes of wrath, but they made it work. But something bigger awaited Roy's in California, pushing him to stardom. Do you want to know that event that transformed Roy's life? Keep watching. When 19-year-old Len returned to Lawndale, his sister Mary had a suggestion that would thoroughly shake up his life. She told him to audition for this local radio show called Midnight Frolic on KMCS in Inglewood. Now keep in mind, Len was naturally pretty shy, but with a nudge from Mary, 
he took the leap. So a few nights later, rocking a Western shirt Mary made for him because who needs designer brands when you've got a talented sister? Len showed up, guitar in hand. He sang, strummed, and even threw in a little yodeling. And guess what? He nailed it. A few days later, he got invited to join a country music group called the Rocky Mountaineers. Not bad for a shy guy, right? In August 1931, Len officially joined the Rocky Mountaineers and quickly sought to grow the group. So he took out an ad in the Los Angeles Herald Examiner for a tenor who could yodel because yodeling was the thing back then. Then came Bob Nolan, a Canadian who answered the ad. Nolan didn't stick around for too long with the group, but he and Len hit it off and stayed in touch. Eventually, Tim Spencer replaced Nolan, and the group kept going. By the spring of 1932, Len, Spencer, and another guy named Slumber Nichols thought they'd give it a go and formed a trio, and it flopped. Sometimes things don't work out, but they didn't give up. Len and Spencer kept bouncing from one group to another throughout the year, trying their luck with bands like the International Cowboys and the O-Bar-O Cowboys. When Spencer decided he needed a break from all the music hustle, Len found himself a new gig with Jack Lefevre and his Texas Outlaws, which were a big deal on local LA radio. Then, in 1933, Len, Bob Nolan, and Tim Spencer reunited and decided to try this whole trio thing again, calling themselves the Pioneers Trio. This time, they meant business. Len was on guitar, Nolan played string bass, and Spencer handled the lead vocals. They rehearsed like crazy, working on their harmonies until they were tighter than a brand new pair of cowboy boots. While Nolan and Spencer started writing original songs for the group, Len juggled this project with his other radio gigs. Things started to click in 1934 when they brought in Hugh Farr, a fiddle player with a deep bass voice that gave their harmonies a whole new dimension. With Farr in the mix, their sound was so polished that a radio announcer decided they needed a name upgrade. Pioneer's trio didn't feel suitable for such a young group, so he rebranded them as the Sons of the Pioneers. And just like that, they had a name that stuck. And they weren't just a trio anymore, they were a full-blown group. By the summer of 1934, these guys weren't just local favorites. Their radio segments started getting syndicated across the country, and they quickly became a national sensation. That led to a recording contract with Decca Records, and on August 8, 1934, they recorded their first tracks, including Bob Nolan's Tumbling Tumbleweeds. Over the next two years, they cranked out 32 songs, including the classic Cool Water. From struggling trios to national stars, the Sons of the Pioneers were officially on the map. Roy wasn't just a music star, he had quite the film career as well. And let's not even talk about how much of a business merchandise he was, hence his museum. Moving on, he took his talents from the stage to the big screen and became a true Western movie legend. Len's leap into the film industry began in 1935, and boy, he hit the ground running. He copped a steady gig in Western films, even landing a sizable supporting role as a singing cowboy while still going by Leonard Sly in a Gene Autry flick. Fast forward to 1938, when Autry found himself in a bit of a money pickle, demanding a hefty paycheck that the studio didn't want to cough up. So they launched a quest for a new singing cowboy who wouldn't break the bank. Singers from all corners of the West, including Willie Phelps of the Phelps Brothers, lined up for the job. And guess what? Len emerged victorious in this musical showdown. He was bestowed the stage name Roy Rogers by Republic Pictures, combining the catchy first name Roy with the iconic Will Rogers last name. With this shiny new title, Roy got the leading role in Under Western Stars, quickly skyrocketing to matinee idol status. Suddenly, he was giving Autry a run for his money as America's favorite singing cowboy. But it wasn't just his films that put him in the limelight. He also made waves in supporting roles, such as in the John Wayne classic Dark Command, 1940, where he shared the screen with future sidekick George Gabby Hayes, suitable for a guy who started as Leonard Sly. Roy's charm was noticed. For 16 consecutive years, from 1939 to 1954, he was a staple in the Motion Picture Herald's Top 10 Money-Making Western Stars poll. He snagged first place from 1943 to 1954. He also dominated the box office poll from 1938 to 1955, 
ranking first from 1943 to 1952. In the final three years, he only lost out to Randolph Scott. If there were cowboy Oscars, Roy would have swept them all. Children adored him. His films made him a legend for the younger crowd. He stood out because he filmed most of his post-war movies in true color, while many Western pals were still in black and white. Some of his films even included comical animal adventures, where his trusty horse Trigger would have his escapades. Can you imagine a horse with its storyline? Only in Roy's world. Roy was no fool when it came to business. In 1940, he smartly negotiated a clause into his contract with Republic Pictures, giving him rights to his name, likeness, and voice for merchandising. That's right, this cowboy knew how to cash in. He launched a whole line of Roy Rogers merchandise, including action figures, cowboy novels, playsets, and a comic strip. His comic book series, Roy Rogers Comics, penned by Gaylord Du Bois, became a hit. It's safe to say he was second only to Walt Disney regarding merchandise featuring his name. Move over, Mickey. Meanwhile, the Sons of the Pioneers, the group Roy had helped make famous, were still going strong. They kept performing, swapping out members as they retired or passed on, but Roy remained connected. Even when he wasn't actively performing with them, they often backed him in films, radio, and TV shows. Talk about a lifelong friendship. In 1944, Destiny brought him together with Dale Evans while filming. They were outspoken about their Christian faith and starting in 1949, joined the Hollywood Christian Group, founded by their friend Lewis Evans Jr. This group included some big names like Billy Graham and Jane Russell. By 1956, they transformed into Bel Air Church. In Apple Valley, California, where they settled down, streets and civic buildings were named after them to honor their work with homeless and disabled children. And if that wasn't enough, Roy was also an active Freemason and Shriner, always supporting their charities. Roy and Dale even had a catchy theme song, Happy Trails, which Dale wrote and they sang as a duet to wrap up their television show. In the fall of 1962, they co-hosted The Roy Rogers and Dale Evans Show, a comedy Western variety program on ABC. Unfortunately, it didn't last long, canceled after just three months because it couldn't compete with The Jackie Gleason Show on CBS. Roy didn't let that get him down. He made plenty of guest appearances on other popular TV shows, often playing himself or other cowboy-type characters, including a memorable spot on Wonder Woman called The Bushwhackers. Roy owned a Hollywood production company that produced his series and took on other projects like the 1955-1956 CBS Western series Brave Eagle. This show featured Keith Larson as a young Cheyenne chief, a new take on the cowboy genre. In 1968, Roy licensed his name to the Marriott Corporation, which rebranded its Hot Shops restaurants into Roy Rogers Restaurants. While he wasn't directly involved in running them, it's safe to say his name was everywhere. In 1970, he triumphantly returned to Lubbock to headline the Texas Tech University Intercollegiate Rodeo alongside Dale. And in 1975, he filmed his last motion picture, Macintosh and TJ, at the 6,666 Ranch, not too far from where he first started. So why did he shut down his museum if Roy was so successful? Closing the Roy Rogers Museum is like saying goodbye to your favorite childhood toy, the one you tried to fix with duct tape for far too long. Once a beloved tribute to the King of the Cowboys, this museum opened in California before moving to a more permanent location in Branson, Missouri. Since 1957, it had been a pilgrimage site for devoted Roy Rogers fans, packed with a treasure trove of artifacts from his illustrious career. We're talking about everything from flashy plastic saddles and carefully designed leather cowboy boots to taxidermy animals that Rogers had once worked with. A particularly poignant story revolves around his close bond with his beloved horse, Trigger. When Trigger passed away, Rogers kept it a secret from his family for a year, unable to bear the thought of burying him. Instead, he had Trigger stuffed and displayed in the museum an unusual and deeply personal collection that resonated with Roy Rogers fans. How many of us would go to such lengths for a beloved pet? So why did the museum close its doors? The answer lies in Roy's instructions to his son. If the museum ever became financially burdensome, it would be liquidated. After his passing in 1998, the family noticed a decline in attendance. Visitors went from thousands to mere dozens, 
It was crushing to everyone involved, but with rising operating costs and dwindling numbers, they decided to shut down in 2009. When the museum closed, everything was auctioned off piecemeal at the famous Christie's Auction House. Roger's son, Dusty, had opinions about where each piece should go, but it wasn't his call. All he wanted to know was what would happen to Trigger. While the family felt sad about seeing their cherished items dispersed, they also recognized the joy it would bring to fans and collectors. The auction in 2010 saw over 338 items from the Roy Rogers collection fly off the shelves, with bids that far surpassed initial estimates. For instance, his first guitar cost $8,750 instead of the assessed $2,000. Show scripts sold five times their price tag, and even Rogers' signed baseball memorabilia went for more than expected. RFD TV station owner Patrick Gotch swooped in and saved Trigger and Bullet, his dog. Gotch nearly lost the chance to win Trigger because of a phone mistake. He couldn't get his bid in over the commotion and yelled, Hit him! Hit him! to bump up the bid. Today, he still receives emails from fans thanking him for saving the Golden Palomino. The end of the auction was emotional. After Dale's horse and Trigger's stunt double went to a private collector, the audience spontaneously sang Happy Trails one last time. The auctioneer, Elkies, described it as the most colorful, emotional, and sentimental sale she'd experienced in her 20 years at Christie's. The long history of the actor, the show, and everything surrounding it was alive in the hearts of many who grew up with Roy Rogers. Even today, as those kids grow up and have their own families, the memory of the golden-tuned King of the Cowboys continues to shine. Roy Rogers passed away on July 6, 1998, at his home in Apple Valley, California, surrounded by his wife, Dale Evans, and other family members. He was 86 years old and had faced multiple heart surgeries in his later years. Remembered as the King of the Cowboys, he may have left this world, but his legacy lives on in our hearts. Cherished for his remarkable performances, musical talents, and unwavering personality. His impact was so significant that then-President Bill Clinton commemorated his death. During a White House Rose Garden appearance, Clinton said, I really appreciate what he stood for, the movies he made, and the kind of values they embodied. He continued, Today, there will be a lot of sad and grateful Americans, especially of my generation, because of his career. Roy's longtime sidekick, Pat Brady, said, he really believed in all those things, truth, kindness, decency, and he lived that way as near as a man could. Gene Autry, another legend, praised him as one of the giants of the movie industry and noted that Roy was also a giant in character, love for family, and faith. Notable figures like Reverend Billy Graham commemorated his passing saying, in real life he stood taller than an icon and reached farther than the stars. He will stand as the example of the best things to come out of Hollywood. His son, Dusty, reflected on his father's legacy, saying, I used to wonder when I was a kid, what in the world was so exciting about this guy? Then I went through all the clippings, the fan mail, and the thousands of pictures of everything he's done. It's almost unbelievable. At the time of his passing, Roy Rogers had 15 grandchildren and 33 great-grandchildren, with his wife and six children still alive. Those children, Roy Rogers Jr., Linda Lou Johnson, Dodie Sailors, Cheryl Barnett, Tom Fox, and Marion Swift carried on his legacy. Roy Rogers Jr. even became the curator of the museum devoted to his father. In addition to the Smithsonian and Children's Museum, the museum was home to various exhibits, and the New York Times published an obituary that mentioned the museum and Roy's frequent visits to engage with guests. He continued to wear his white Stetson, gabardine suits, and silver and leather belts, even though his legs ached, proving that the King of the Cowboys never indeed hung up his spurs. While the Roy Rogers Museum may no longer stand, the legacy of Roy and Dale will forever inspire future generations.